Hi everyone, Dan Elliott here, and welcome to the DocuPen channel. In this video, we'll be correcting for non-uniform UVs by using those sampled UV values around the hit point and measuring the stretch and squish and scale of the geometry so that we can draw corrected damage splats into the render targets for each object. We don't need these debug arrow nodes anymore, so we can get rid of those. And let's not forget to reconnect the line trace to the branch. Now might be a good time to do a little bit of rearranging. So we can get these offset positions and the make hit result nodes, and we'll drag them down a bit, and these can go into a comment block, which I'll call UV samples. Now let's group these collision UV nodes together. We have the main one from the first hit, and the two offset ones from the manually made hit results just below that. So now we will calculate the difference between original hit UV and the first UV at the offset position by subtracting one from the other. And we can do the same to the second UV by subtracting the original hit UV from that as well. By themselves, the two UV offsets don't really tell us anything, but by adding them together, we can use ideas from the Pythagorean formula to find out how big this stretched area is Adding them together is much like finding the diagonal of a right-angled triangle. If we then find the length of that diagonal vector using a vector 2D length node, we can normalize the scale of the image that is drawn into the brush by feeding in a scalar parameter to counteract that scale. So if we go up to where we're setting the position of the brush and make a little bit of room, we can create a set scalar parameter value, which is actually a bit easier if we drag off from the brush and do that. Now sometimes the wrong variant of the node is created, as we just saw, because some of them work on parameter collections and things like that. The one we want is the one that works on material instance dynamic objects. And once that's created, we'll connect it up in the chain, and for the parameter, we'll call it scale, and for the value, we'll choose the calculated length of the diagonal between the two UV offsets that we just made down below. Now we need to go into the material and make sure that there is a parameter called scale that will respond to the value that's being set. We want a scalar parameter as it's just a single float value. We have to name it scale and it's probably best to set a default value of one here so that if we're not feeding in the parameter, then it will just stay at one. And we just simply connect it up to the divide node, which controls the scale factor in this material. Now, when we go and test this out in the level, the plane here responds just fine, and the cylinder looks like it's the same size, and also the back wall looks like the size is roughly the same as well, not taking into account the stretching, of course. But that's good enough for the scale, as everything is roughly about the same size. Now let's go and tackle the stretching. If we go back to our two UV samples at the offset positions, we can imagine seeing them in UV space, as potentially being rotated and stretched away from the U and V axes. To find out how much they have deviated, we can use a dot product operation, which will project the vectors onto the U and V axes and give us a correction factor that we can use to again feed into the brush material, which will invert that squash and stretch for us. So create a dot product node, and we want the 2D variant. And plug in one of the UV offsets which could represent the U direction of how the UVs look from the perspective of the world. If we do a dot product with one comma zero, which is the standard U axis, we'll see how much it is off. And the result is how far along U the projection lands. It's the same for V. If we take the other UV offset and do a dot product against the V axis, which is zero comma one, we'll see where it projects onto that axis. And that's the correcting factor that we want. Now we just need to feed it into the brush. So we can make a vector from these two corrective U and V float components. And we need to set another parameter on the brush. Go back up to where we're setting the parameters and make a bit more room. And we'll drag off from the brush and create a set vector parameter node. We'll put that in its place and connect it up. And for the parameter name, let's call it squish. And for the value, Let's plug in the corrective projection we just made. This is another candidate for a comment block, which I'll call UV scale and squish. Back in the material, 
we need to make the squish parameter, which will be controlled by the blueprint command. This is going to be a vector parameter called squish. And let's just make the default 1, 1 to mean the same stretchiness in both directions. Also, we don't know the range of the values coming in, so I'm going to normalize the incoming stretch vector to make it scale independent, because we're going to multiply with the scale factor which we already have with a multiply node. Connect up the scale parameter, and then we need to do a component mask to turn it into a 2D vector again. And that can go straight into our scale factor in the division node. Let's try it out. And the plane looks okay. The cylinder looks okay. No stretching there. And the back wall looks like the stretching has been fixed too. The resolution on the back wall for the render target though is really low for this size of wall, which is why it's looking blotchy and blocky. It might be a tiny bit small as well. So we can go and add a quick multiply on top of the scale parameter in the material. And I'll set it to 2.5 just to fudge it up a bit. And that should do it. Now for the resolution for the back wall, it might need to be bumped up to 2048 squared. So let's try that. It's a bit better. But it would be nice if we could make only large objects have a higher resolution, as smaller objects wouldn't need higher than 1024 resolution. For example, if I apply the material to these small boxes, and they all start getting 2K or 4K textures, then the GPU RAM might quickly get filled up. But before we look at dynamically choosing texture resolutions per object though, in the next video we'll take a break and we're going to be looking at augmenting this effect with a small particle system to make it look a bit more interesting. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.